11 years ago at this time, I was having a bad day. I had just caught my case to use some prison parlance. So with the goal that all of you will make better decisions than me, both before, during, and after prison, I'm gonna share some tips and tricks for those of you under investigation, for those of you who know that you're going to prison. And of course, if you're going to prison, you're certainly coming home. So this is the encore edition of my tips and tricks. Uh, to be totally honest, I can't say that anyone actually reached out and said, can you do an encore of any video? But I did get some emails and some text messages and calls from people that said they, sound, they found value in the initial video. So I said, let's go ahead and do it again. So let's get started. Hey everyone, Justin McPerny, good to be with you. Uh, as I mentioned last month, I filmed a video uh, with some tricks and tips for life in a federal prison camp. I'd like to thank you for watching it, for the likes, uh, for the comments from Lizette and Chris. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Okay, so thank you very much for the comments, the positive comments. Um, but while I get some positive comments, I'd also like to thank the person who took the time, who invested the energy and the thoughtfulness, <laughs> the thoughtfulness of sending this message that said, um, hey Justin, nice opening. You suck, your books suck, and so do your blogs. Your videos suck too and your dogs are ugly. Okay. Have you seen my dogs? Have you seen them? Okay. Let's just, I'm going to deviate. If you tune out, if you don't like the video, I'm sorry, but I got to defend my dogs. This is Cody, my dog. Awesome. Okay. Here's Memphis, my wife's dog. A little, we didn't get off to the greatest start, but I love this guy. I love both these dogs. So bashing the dogs come on let's keep the family and the dogs out of it okay if you don't like the video i'm sorry okay but bashing the dogs look at these dogs in fact i'm going to put them i'm going to splice these i'm going to put these dogs side by side so every viewer can recognize the beauty and awesomeness of our dogs we're a dog family don't bash the dogs come on okay if you're still with me and you haven't tuned out and you're wondering when in the hell am i going to get you some federal prison advice that can help you I'm ready, so let's get started. 11 years ago today, I learned that I had caught my case. So the first tip for those of you who might be under federal investigation is to accept responsibility sooner if you are guilty. Now, I know it takes a little time to own it, to recognize it, to embrace the rationalizations, the pressures, the opportunities. I talk about all that, I talk about all that in my second book, Ethics in Motion, which continues to not be reviewed as well as the first book, but that's cool. But if you want to better understand some of those pressures, read Ethics in Motion, I'll send it to you, it's free. If you can accept responsibility sooner and get your file off the government's desk, they will have less resources invested in you. You can get in, get out, be productive, and move on with your life. Uh, I began working with a wonderful gentleman earlier this week, and he's like, you know, Justin, I don't think I'm looking at that long of a prison term, but let me tell you one thing that your work has helped me done well. I'm like, well, what? Tell me, talk to me. He's like, I don't want to serve one day longer in prison than I have to. So even though I'm only looking at a measly year and a day, He's like, I'm already in jail. I feel it every second of every single day this case is on, my, is on my mind. I feel it. I know it. I think it. I can hardly, you know, sleep half the time. This is what he said before he hired me. So he's like, I might only get a year and a day, but by accepting responsibility sooner, I'm moving on to the next phase. So tip one, if you are guilty, and you know you're guilty, and some of you watching this, you know you did some bad things. Now, 11 years ago, I was in La La Land, laying on the floor of my business partner, Sam Pompeo's office, lamenting over how people were coming after me, and it was UBS's fault, and my senior partner's fault. I was so clouded, so I was off my game. It took three and a half years for me to go to jail. I might as well have served five years, 18 months plus three and a half years. That's to those of you who knocked that I only served 18 months in jail. It was 18 months plus the three and a half years. Jail was easier, trust me. So tip number one, accept responsibility sooner. Number two, I cannot get over how many defendants hire lawyers without, well, doing their due diligence, but also reviewing a sentencing memorandum. If you've seen a sentencing memorandum, um, you should see how well your lawyers write, the data they use, check case studies, and look at how well they've argued on behalf of other clients. Uh, I mean, are you doing that? So for those of you who are looking to hire a lawyer, or for those of you who have hired a lawyer, the first thing you should do after liking this video, subscribing and leaving a positive comment, and preferably one that doesn't say my dogs are ugly, is to send an email to your lawyer and say, I'd love to see one of your sentencing memorandums. I'd love to see how successfully you have argued for your other clients. Now, some of them may give you the blow off and be like, we're not ready to show that with you yet. Remember who's running the show, you're the client. Respectfully remind them that you'd like to see a sentencing memorandum. Last point on the sentencing memorandum. It does no good if you get a copy of the sentencing memorandum 15 minutes before it's due. 
uh, last year Michael Santos and I worked on a case and we begged our client to reach out to the lawyer to get a copy of the sentencing memorandum. And this client was very nice, polite, deferential to the lawyer, didn't want to push him, didn't want to prod him. And fortunately, because we urged him to get a copy of the sentencing mandem, or memorandum several weeks in advance, he was able to make some changes to it, some suggestions to able to augment the argument of why his client should not go to prison. So our client followed through, yep. he held us accountable, he's got to hold the lawyer accountable. So to all of you, Get a copy of the sentencing memorandum. If you haven't yet hired a lawyer, review it. If you've already hired a lawyer, get a copy. Further, make sure you get it in advance because it does no good to get a sentencing memorandum from your lawyer. If he says, hey, let me know your thoughts. It's due in 15 minutes. Total wasted time. Okay, so let's talk about two tricks for those of you who have yet to go to prison. Number one, pick the right prison and pick the surrender date of your choosing. Makes sense, right? If 74% of recommendations, according to the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, are followed by the BOP, wouldn't it make sense to get the right prison on the record and the surrender date of your choosing? So uh, we have a very awesome calculator that we use at White Collar Advice, and it enables our clients to pick the surrender date of their choosing. And frankly, the way, and also the way the BOP calculates incarceration time, you can serve some fewer days in prison based on the date that you surrendered. Pretty cool. So let's just say you're sentenced on May 20th, 2017, and that is in honor of my dog, Honey, whose birth date is May 20th. Also happens to be my release date from prison. This is a dog-themed video. Stay with me. So let's just say we say your sentencing date is May 20th, 2017. Let's just say you're gonna get an exact sentence of one year and one day. Let's pull this up a little bit. Make sure that we can see that. You gotta have an exact sentence of one year and one day. Uh, I have a client getting sentenced in New York, one triple zero one male minimum. And I'm going to give you credit for one day in custody, which you get when you're arraigned. So a good trick if you're going to you know, pick your prison is to pick one that you're going to get. So use this calculator, and it gives you the best locations to request. Otisville, for example, has capacity of 120. And right now they have population of 113, which is very low. Much of the time, Otisville in New York is like capacity of 120, population of 119 is very unlikely. So my suggestion for you, if the odds are the BOP is going to follow your prison recommendation. Get one on the record and make sure it is a prison you are likely to get. You know, it does no good to ask for a facility. If you look at this calculator, for example, you ask for Hazleton and it's unlikely you're, that you're going to get it because there's no room for you. So another trick, pick the right prison further. You can also pick your best days to report. So I randomly pick May 20th right now because it's my old dog, my honey's birthday. Um, but you can see based on the date that you pick, you would serve a few days less in prison, 315 days, 316, 317. This calculator can shave as many as six days off. So I'm not delusional. I'm not saying it's the game changer of the century, but hey, you know, six days is six days. Second tip, try to surrender the middle of the month for commissary. Again, at the end of the day, you know, it's not the hugest deal in the world, but this is a little trick. If you're going to ask for a surrender date, and it's likely that you're going to get it, presuming you've done your homework with your lawyer at sentencing, get a surrender date that enables you to go around the middle of the month, which if you have the means, enables you to get like one or two full commissary shoppings in for $360 a month, then you reboot on the first. Pretty cool. You go in on the 15th, the 18th, the 20th, you get a couple of shoppings in, you buy the shoes, you buy the sweatpants, you buy the MP3 player, you buy some food. 360 if you have the means goes pretty damn quick, then it reboots on the 1st. I went in on the 28th of April, I had my first shopping May 1st, I was out of money by the 15th, I was hustling by the 20th, I was borrowing by the 24th. Even though I was a former money manager that managed in excess of 200 million bucks, I managed money in prison like I was a two year old. I was always buying the eight ball with respect to, rest, with respect to commissary. So if you can choose your surrender date and you have the means to maximize your time in the commissary, Surrender to the 15th to the 20th of the month to get in some shoppings. Okay, let's transition to tips and tricks on the inside. The first one, when you have that team meeting with your case manager or counselor, don't let them know that you have a job waiting for you. You might not have a job waiting for you, regardless of what you think. It's an interesting system. For inmates that have jobs, they're less likely to get more time in the halfway house because they don't really need as much time in the halfway house if they have a job. It's crazy, right? You're going to get more time in the halfway house or in the community if you actually need it. So my initial suggestion, uh, you don't have a job. It's part of the reason you need additional time in the community. And do not have lawyers sending letters demanding 
uh, that you need more halfway house time. It's a bit of a disconnect if you claim you have no money and you need a job, yet your case manager is getting a letter from a lawyer. You have no job. It'll help you get some more time in the halfway house. That's an important tip. Another one, visitation. My mom is awesome. She supported me um, by writing my, typing out my blogs and my book. And I share this with you because in visitation, the nice guards at Taft Camp sent my mom away three times to the local Walmart. Was it Walmart? Could have been a Target. Costco? I think it was a Walmart. They said my mom wasn't dressed accordingly, which is absurd because she's 73 years old and conservative. Yet they turned her away, in part because some guards enjoy it. Um, I don't know why. It's weird. Some guards are jealous that we actually get to leave prison and they're there for like their whole career. And I think they take it out on some people. Perhaps they took it out on my awesome mom. How does that, what, how does that help you? Right, that's why you're watching this video. How does this help you? Bring an extra set of clothes in the car in case some guard who's jealous of you or who has had a bad day says that your guests or visitors are not dressed appropriately. Pay, test, pay attention to the visitation schedule. Uh, make sure the visitation is open that day. Sometimes prisons close visitation. Go to the BOP.gov to check. Make sure that you're dressed appropriately. And just in case, bring an extra set of clothes in the car. I wish my mom had brought some extra set of clothes in the car so we didn't, I didn't have to blow 30 phone minutes tracking down where she was. I thought she was in an accident and I couldn't find her. Little did I know she's in a Walmart or Costco or Target buying clothes. Kind of ruined the day. I was angry. I was upset. Profit from my experience and my losses. Dress accordingly. Bring an extra set of clothes. Third, exercise. Look, in prison, you're going to be like 40, 50 yards away from a track. I went in chubby, bloated, miserable, off my game, angry, and suddenly, you know, I was a college athlete, and I'm 50 yards, 100 yards away from this track, and I'm like, oh, I'm back in. I'm sort of all or nothing. I was very excited to begin exercise, and the problem was I got hurt early because I had let my body atrophy for so long, and just like that, I'm you know, in prison exercising all day. Transition. For those of you watching this who have yet to go to prison, begin to do some stretching, some walking, some light running because you're going to get hurt if you surrender to prison and just like that, you're so gung-ho. I mean, I've had clients who's 100, 150 pounds, but I begged them and they began to exercise slowly, moderately before they work their way into the facility. And lastly, exercise in doses that you can maintain. I've run into at least 20 people since my release from prison in August of 09. 20, 19 of them have put on the weight and then some, primarily because you're not gonna be able to exercise 12 hours a day when you come home from prison, like some men do. They will walk the track all day and you'll lose weight doing that. But you can't maintain that when you come home and with food and temptation in front of you, it's very easy to put the weight back on. Let's transition to a couple of tricks for life on the inside. When you surrender to prison, I know you're in a daze and there's a bit of a you know, fog around you. Part of the reason I do this work is so you're not in that daze or that, that fog. Um, start watching when you walk into that dorm and look at where you'd like to live someday. A uh, bunk isn't the hugest thing in the world. I frequently said you shouldn't hire a guy like me to get a better bunk. You know, I can help you position yourself for it. That's really why I'm giving it to you free in this video. I think it's tragic that some men try to charge for something like that. Um, when you get there, look at where you'd like to live. Would you like to move back in the dorm someday, which can make your experience a little bit easier? So look at where would you like to live? Can you make friends with someone who's in that bunk? Or is there going to be an opening? Is someone transferring to the residential drug abuse program? Are they furloughing? Are they getting transferred? Form a friendship with somebody, perhaps. And when there's an opening, you can write what's called a cop out or request to staff to move into that cubicle. Pretty cool, right? I did that with my Bunky J, who is awesome, a phenomenal chef. I, I, I've yet to have some, me some of the best meals I ever had in prison were from Jay, who cooked them. Been in 12 or 13 years. He was in the back of the dorm. He exercised. He woke early as I did. We got along well. We were both quiet. We were respectful. So the second that I learned Danny, his bunkie, was transferring, I went to Jay and said, hey, bud, can I move into your bunk? And this is maybe after four months. And my uh, the case manager, a counselor, went to him because a number of people wanted to move in. And she said, who do you want to move in? He said, Justin. It was a great, we were good buddies. Look at where you'd like to live. Secondly, when you, if you have a short sentence, a year and a day, 18 months, two years, three years, you're going to buy a lot of stuff when you get there. Shoes, sweatpants, a number of things. And there's a number of longer term prisoners who don't have the resources to buy things. So another trip for you, trick, trip, trick for you to consider, men might ask you for things. They might ask you for your sweatpants and your shoes. Uh, be careful about what you agree to give away because believe it or not, there is a man that will wait a pair of shoes, a year for your shoes. 
that will wait a year and a half for your sweatpants because they don't have money coming in and it's $40 they don't have to buy and they can plan on it. So I strategically gave away some of my items and I did it in a way where I wouldn't, a prison can be emasculating, right? We have people, we're not with women and we have, um, you know, we're separated from women, our families are sending us money. We, it can be an insecure environment. So what I did was I went up to um, a longer term prisoner who mentored some of the newer inmates that came in. And I went up to him and I said, hey bud, I'm, I know you don't need this stuff. I know you don't need it. But uh, I'm going home in like nine months. This was November 18th, 2009. November 18th, 2008, and I got my release date, which would be May 20th, 2009. And I said, hey, but I'm going home. I'm not going to need this stuff. Would you like to give it out to some of the, you know, some of your friends that you mentor? And I did it in a respectful way, not offering it to him because I thought he needed it, which he didn't. I thought he might want to disperse it. And he was grateful. He's like, well, what can I have? I said, but you could have all of it. I don't want to leave here with anything but the lessons I learned and some books. I said, okay, I'll, that'd be great. Thanks, man. So when I left, he got three pairs of shoes and my sweatpants and my sweatshirt and t-shirts and a ton of stuff. But this ties into how strategically it helped me. And this will be the third tip that I share for life inside of a federal prison on this video. The encore edition that no one actually asked for. But I'm doing it. I'm doing it. The third tip was this gentleman with whom I gave, agreed to give these clothes and all my items to, he was the head orderly in the dorm. So at Taft Camp, there's like a four-month requirement in the kitchen. So I went in in May, and like around November, I had agreed to give him all of my things for no money. I don't want to sell it. Just take it. And he was the head orderly in the dorm. He controlled all of the jobs in the, in, you know, in the dorm, like scrubbing toilets, mopping floors, emptying the garbage. There's some good and bad orderly jobs. So I knew that he controlled them. So after I had served my requisite 120 days in the kitchen, I went to him and I said, hey, bud, I served my time in the kitchen. I'd love to become an orderly. You know what he said? What do you want? Pick your job. I was like, this is awesome. So I picked a job where for 15 minutes a day, five days a week, I mopped floors. And it was pretty easy. I did my job. Administrators saw me. Um, kind of like doing it in a strange way. I'd never really done anything like that before. Good for me. A little humility isn't a terrible thing. So third tip, um, form a strategic alliance with someone you might give away your items to as you're one, two, or even three years out from the door. Look for an inmate who may be in a position of power, as I did, who controls myriad jobs inside the prison. Befriend him, then ask him for a job that suits your needs. So, okay, we've made it to life after federal prison. I was challenged to keep this video beneath 15 minutes. Um, it's not going to happen. There's no chance. I just simply talk too much. I can't help it. Okay, so let's talk about two tips for life after federal prison. I filmed a video a couple of weeks ago called Dating After Federal Prison. And I had a few buddies and clients reach out to me and say, dude, how many first dates did you have where you knew you might not ever see this person again because you didn't like her and she didn't like you? And you knew it was going to be one date, so why can't you just chill, have a beer, relax? Why do you got to get into your story and then you went to jail? It's a good point. The answer is... Um, I always wanted to work to tell my story. That might sound terrible that I'm on a first date and I'm strategically thinking about ways to improve my story. But when I was on a first date and I knew that it might not work out, I was thinking, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity. For those of you who are e immersed in the system, how well can you tell your story? In a minute, three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Well, sometimes I talk too long. If you put me on the stopwatch, I can do it. Call me, I'll do it in a minute, three minutes, five minutes. Can you? So I did it thousands of times. So for those of you who told me that I was too rigid and I should chill, and when I was on a first date that I knew wasn't going to go anywhere, I didn't need to get into the fact that I went to jail, I will acknowledge the part of it was a little selfish. It was a chance for me to tell my story, gauge the response, measure it, and improve. So I still believe that those of you who are home from prison, who are on a first date where you know it's not going to go anywhere. You can get, you know, be nonchalant, it's all cool, not talk about it, and that's fine. Or it's an opportunity to tell your story. That's what I did, you gotta make your own decisions. Uh, another tip on life after prison, be careful about how much permission you ask from your probation officer. You have to get permission to travel. Okay, I get that. Uh, you need permission to do certain things. I didn't ask for permission to start my business. 
when you ask the probation officer for permission, they're either going to say no or we'll let you know. There's actually been a few people that I wanted to hire since my release from prison who had excellent resumes through prison. And they reached out to me and I said, let me advise you on how to communicate with your probation officer. And they're like, oh my God, I already have. I said, well, that's a done deal. That's a done deal. If you have already told them that you're going to work with me, a convicted felon, they're done. They said, no, 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 Justin. I let them know that you've lectured all over the country. You've been to the FBI and pretrial. I said, yeah, we have no chance. No, I told them you've been to NYU and, you know, you write books and, you know, you've been on TV. I said, it doesn't matter. It's a done deal. They're going to see Justin McBurney, convicted felon that facilitated a Ponzi scheme. You ask their permission. So tip, you need to build a career on the inside hit the ground running as I did. So upon your release, you're not saying, Mr. Probation Officer, may I please go do this? It is, I have begun working on this. I am a convicted felon with few opportunities. I've lost my licenses. I've embarrassed my family. You've heard me say this before, right? I've embarrassed my family. I've ruined my career. I've created victims. I meant it when I said to the judge, I'd like to pay back the restitution, but I can't pay back the restitution if I have three cents to my name. No one will hire me. If anything, they'll rip up my resume. I got, no, I got nothing. So this is what I'm doing. I'll keep you apprised. I expect to grow this business and sustain myself. Thank you. You can expect my weekly or monthly report. Not asking for permission. The question is, do you have a record? And if I had my book or a blog, I'd hold it up right now, but I don't. Pretend I'm holding my book, Lessons from Prison, which you can get for free at whitecollaradvice.com. Have that record. Have that resume. Do not always ask for their permission because they ain't going to give it. They're bureaucrats. It's what they're supposed to do. They're going to say no or say, we'll let you know. Before you know it, three years have gone by and you're like, will I ever hear from them? Nope. Okay, so let me close with two tricks that will make your post-prison life uh, measurably better. And even now, before you go in, you got to be thinking about life after prison. Uh, a couple of things that I did that I hope help you. Uh, I wrote a blog in prison called Why I Say Thank You. And before I caught my case or during my case, I was very caught up in my own life, how my life was imploding. Poor Justin, how, what did I do? Why me? Why me? It's pretty pathetic. But in prison, I became very grateful. I developed a sense of tolerance and perspective. And of course, I'm so grateful to Michael Santos, my mentor. So grateful for him getting me on track. And he helped me develop a sense of tolerance and perspective and reminded me, even though he'd been in prison for so long, he said, bud, you're going to be home soon. And I'm ascending this metaphorical you that I wrote about in Lessons from Prison. You should all be ascending the you the second you get to prison. That's actually another trick. That'll be in the encore, encore. Okay, I'm wasting enough time here. You're going to develop tolerance and perspective in prison if you've worked hard. When you come home on days where it's tough and you're angry and you're upset and you might not have the opportunities that you think or people aren't responding to you the way they should or people who stuck by you for a long time are letting you down and you're upset over all, you're feeling the aftermath of everything. Take a breath, stop as I did, and be grateful for the tolerance. Feel that tolerance and perspective. Recognize that good buddies of yours, your boys are back in jail, maybe serving five or 10 years for ridiculous nonviolent drug crimes. Maybe they got five years left because they couldn't afford the best lawyer. Develop that sense of tolerance and perspective. Maintain it when you come home. It's one thing that I did well. I would. Upon my release, I'd visit with friends in Beverly Hills, insurance agents, brokers, athletes, friends I used to spend a lot of time with who were retiring at 35 and 40. I have millions of dollars in the bank, and yet here I am rebuilding. And I, I would still get a little bit jealous and get a little bit angry and say, God, my bad decisions were so catastrophic, right? What happened? And I would stop, and I would feel grateful. And I'd think of my buddy Jay, who had another five years to serve, and how he handled his experience with humility and dignity. I beg you when you come home from prison to remember that perspective and tolerance that you built up. Do not compare yourself to others. That's my worst trait. Till this day, I don't fully appreciate the success I've had from prison. And boy, have I worked hard and gotten a lot of criticism along the way. It's still coming. You're going to get it if you're successful. Or you can sit on the sidelines and do nothing. I don't want to sit on the sideline. Keep the criticisms coming. Tell me my videos suck. My blogs suck. My book sucks. Don't bash my dog, but I welcome the criticism, in part because of my experience. Last tip, talk about tolerance and perspective, and maybe these are sort of tied together. Send thank you letters. Um, Michael Santos was an incredible writer of thank you letters from prison. And upon my release, while I'm home and my buddy's still serving many years in prison, he would send me these thank you letters and updates on what he was doing. So till this day, I still send them, not as many as I should. I send 10 times more upon my release from prison than I do now. 
and I got the iPhone, the texting, the email, and I'm kind of caught back up in life and the busyness of it with a family and career. I get it. But occasionally it's nice to pull out a pen and paper and send a thank you letter to someone who supported you during this journey to let them know that you didn't use them as an opportunity to help them, to have them help you during this tough time, but rather you continue to remain grateful for the love and support that they showed you. Um, it's a longer video than I had hoped. These are some tips and tricks, the Encore edition. I'm going to close by putting up my beautiful dogs on the screen. Cody and Memphis were a dog family. More importantly, hope you found val value in this video. These Think big, reverse engineer your way to success. Think about where you'd like to be in five years, and you'll know what you need to do the year before, two years before. You'll know what you need to do tomorrow. Start by subscribing to this channel as more videos like this are coming. Thank you for your time. I wish you all well for letting me have a little bit of fun in this video, for lightening up a little bit. Happy holidays 11 years ago. Today I caught my case. I never thought it would end, but here I am, strong, healthy, and happy, um, and happy to help you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.